Hey folks, this is Zach Oster from here, Island Center, Indianapolis Star. This is Monday Banners for Monday, March 11th, 2024. I'm speaking a little softly today. One, because I, I'm still getting my voice back from a cold. Two, because my two-year-old is napping on the other side of the wall. Uh, with me, as always, is Mike Nineslick. I don't think he's got a two-year-old napping on the other side of the wall, but he looks like maybe he could use a nap himself, having just uh, yawned, surely uh, flogging himself to the wonderful nightlife of Minneapolis these last few days. Uh, Mike, how we doing? I'm good. How are you, Zach? I could I could do without the congestion of a chest, but other than that, um, talking about I guess sort of a little bit of a recap of the last week or so of IU men's basketball. You know, we did a preseason or preseason, excuse me, a postseason preview for the women. It won't be as detailed for obvious reasons, but we'll do a bit of a postseason preview for the men. But I guess first of all, um, I think last time we talked was what Thursday after the everything came down around Woodson being confirmed to staying and then. Indiana um, uh, beat Minnesota, and then Indiana, of course, lost Liam McNeely. And Indiana came home Sunday and had, I would say, by all accounts, a fascinating day, (laughs) senior day. Um, (laughs) They beat Michigan State 65 to 64. They lost Trey Galloway to, I think it's probably fair to say, an, an apparent aggravation of a previous injury. Though Galloway suggested he'll be healthy for the postseason. Um, they had Trent Sisley and Braylon Mullins, probably their two most important recruits in the 2025 class court side. They got word from Anthony Leal and Trey Galloway that both players would be back for their COVID allowed fifth years next year. Leal told Indiana fans to quote, chill out. And then it's fair to say that Mike Woodson made his, um, his own particular sort of opinions at this moment in time, uh, clear, when he said, uh, I'm the coach, and he talked a lot about true fans. So I guess, you know, Mike, you watched from afar. What was it like? What was, what was the what was the Indiana basketball experience from Mar- Sunday, March 10th, 2024, like uh, from 10,000 feet? Well, Anthony Walker gave by far the most emotional speech. <laughs> he just said, thanks. <laughs> no, um, it, it was good theater. Uh, you know, I think now we know why Mike Woodson said, I mean, Mike Woodson received some criticism for why he didn't know if, you know, Trey and Anthony Leal were going through senior day. And I think that, you know, they were trying to set this up to sort of have an impact um, and give them a chance to sort of have their moment. Um, I thought that all made for, um, you know, it was powerful in terms of the fans are excited and, you know, it was, it was all unfolded. Um, uh uh, it was dramatic um and then you know mike woodson gets on there and works blue uh very <laughs> the live mic um uh but that was certainly um you know and then and i think it co- you got to combine it too with that in the post game again he declined to sort of talk about the topics that he uh shouldn't have to that that he's done enough and that those that topic we is should like, say oh. he did talk about just not with the media <laughs> that's what i'm saying like in the post about them unprompted with the fan base he did right. not win probably right. talk about them with the media. in the press conference he gave sort of a similar answer he gave it wednesday in minnesota about how that's on un- that's not a fair sort of question um was the, you know we talked about his messaging a lot on friday i don't know that this is the best way to go about it um cuz you know you're picking a fight with the fans you better win next year right or or so, a group of the fandom um and i i think that's a tricky sort of road to uh go down right sorry I was reaching for my mute button there no i think that's fair i mean listen it's everything about this is is just a little weird like if you think about just like the last eight days or nine days, you know, Indiana comes from behind 16 points to beat Maryland in a game that I think ultimately it does feel a little bit like if Indiana loses that game, the season probably just sort of peters out. Then there's this groundswell of speculation that Woodson might be removed, retired, or whatever, even going so far as to like there were accounts on Twitter that would have you believe that Indiana had basically already agreed you know, like a contract with his replacement all but you know all but on paper. Then on Wednesday evening, 
news breaks that Woodson will be returning for next season, which I don't think should have been that surprising to anyone, all things considered. Indiana goes away to Minnesota and probably puts in its best win of the season. That's not saying it's done. I get that, but it's still probably Indiana's best overall performance of the season. And it seems like things are pointing in a good direction. <laughs> then the next night, Liam McNeely decommits. Then there's all the fear that you mentioned, which felt a little bit manufactured, or if not manufactured, maybe maybe sort of a product of its environment around the Galloway and Leal stuff, where I think you're right. I think there's just kind of a level of like, oh, I'm going to give them their moment. Like, I'm not going to spoil that. I'm not going to hint at it. I'm not, you know. Um, but, the, you know, that undeniably sort of follows everything into the weekend and probably deepens this this sort of concern that everybody's going to leave, the whole roster is going to transfer, and you're going to start from zero first or whatever. And then Indiana, you know, I think deservedly beats Michigan State particularly, and we'll talk about this game in a, specifically in a little bit, but like having to work out, you know, kind of what to do without Trey Galloway in that game, I think it was very difficult for Indiana. I think they did to their credit. Um, and then after the game, you know, Leo and Galloway announce what they announce. Leo says what he says. Woodson says what he says. And it's just, and, and then you get to Monday morning and I, I revisited my, um, uh, in something I filed today for tomorrow, our, all our preseason media picks. And there were three teams that the media picked in the spot where they finished the Big Ten. If you consider, if you take basically seeding as final position in the Big Ten, Purdue number one, Wisconsin number five, and Indiana number six. And I recognize that Indiana's journey to the number six seed in the Big Ten tournament was a pretty odd one in some respects. But if I told you in the preseason that Indiana would be 18 and 13 and 10 and 10 in the league and finish sixth in the conference, you would have said, I mean, given what they lost and how much they turned over and what they returned, like that's that's not a totally unreasonable projection. It's probably a little disappointing, but it's not totally unreasonable. It just feels like we have visited kind of both extremes of sort of the emotional spectrum for IU fans in the last, you know, nine days and then just wound up back in the middle, which is basically just – Indiana more or less met expectations. Yeah, and I mean, I think the time, uh, you know, when they with what the administration was trying to do is cut the speculation off, and I get what they're trying to do. And the season did was like one game away, like you said, from sort of like an abject disaster. You know, in terms of like at least Xavier Johnson game. like literally said like right, two weeks ago, if we get hit in the face, we probably don't get back up. But today, yeah, I mean, we do. like if they had lost all four of these games, like there's that's fair, right? To say, like, well, we're bringing them back, we got to say something, you know, whatever. And so, but they did it after two wins, I think the time, or I mean, after a win to try to um thread the needle with the timing so they don't have to do it after a loss or before senior day. And so, I mean, I get why they did what they did. Um, I don't think it was necessarily the wrong move, and I get the criticism of Woodson. I mean, um, cameo, uh. I get that. I mean, I, I I don't think Mike Woodson's immune from criticism this season. And it feels like it went way too far, maybe, in, in some corners. And maybe that's why he's talking about true fans. But I, I, I find it strange just kind of with his experience being in the NBA, how he's sort of, I mean, maybe because of its his alma mater that he's sort of, I don't know. He's taken it to a personal level. I feel like. I think. I mean. Necessary. I think the. I think the NBA thing actually is an interesting thread because, like, for example, um, you know, I mean, Indiana is nowhere near the term bubble right now. Which, if I gave you some of Indiana's metrics, I think they have a quad one and two wins. They have a Kim Palm strength of schedule of fifteen. Um, you know, they have the same record as Michigan State which is a team that a lot of people assume is probably safely in the tournament no matter what happens this week in Minneapolis. I'm not totally sure I agree with that, but I think they're, you know, they're in much better yeah. shape than Indiana. Um, You know, Indiana's got, I'm just looking at it right now, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, Ken Palm top 100 wins. <clears throat> it's got four true road wins in conference play, including three against teams that are, Ken, uh, Ken Palm top 75 or better. Um, like, there are parts of Indiana's theoretical resume that make perfect sense for a bubble team. And they're nowhere near. And the reason they're nowhere near is because 
the metrics hate them. The computers hate them. And the reason the computers hate them, if you look at their, um, you know, particularly at their efficiency numbers, is when they win, they win close. When they lose, they lose big. Too many of the games where they could inflate their efficiency numbers, and this is kind of coming to the mainstream because that really good piece. I don't know if you saw it that Scott Van Pelt did about the the Big Twelve a couple weeks ago. Basically, the Big Twelve made this concerted effort for everybody to like run up scores and, and play empty calorie games in the non conference and inflate their net numbers so that by the time everybody got the Big Twelve play, like everybody's net ranking would be such that so many of your games would be quad one and two wins that everyone would just pick up a bunch of quality wins and most of your losses wouldn't hurt. Essentially, and that's why the Big 12s wound up with, you know, nine, ten, whatever teams in, in the tournament field as of now. Um, you know, Indiana only beat Florida Gulf Coast by six, only beat Army by eight, only beat Wright State by nine, only beat Morehead State by one, and so on. And the point is, that stuff matters in college. Win-loss record is not the only thing that matters in college, the way that it is in the NBA. In the NBA, there is an extent which is just like, well, listen, you know, you know, finish over this benchmark, you make the playoffs, and then you can kind of start over from there. And you can just kind of, you know, work the matchups according to what you have. But in college, you ha- you are a little bit beholden to some of these metrics, and you are a little bit required. I think about a game like Minnesota at home, when Indiana's up, you know, I think at one point in that game, Indiana's up 41 points, and that's 12 and a half minutes left in the second half. That's not, you know, just some first half surge. And then Indiana, we, I've seen Woodson do this before, kind of takes its foot off the gas. And Minnesota winds up eating back into that deficit. And they only, still only win by, or they still only lose by 12. But there's a difference in the computer's evaluation between 12 and 20 in a game like that. And I'm using this as a placeholder. I'm using it as an example sort of from a different angle. But I do wonder sometimes if, like, there's an extent to which Woodson still does think in more of an NBA way about the KPIs of his job you know, essentially, then, I mean, I'm sure some of it is, you know, his passion for Indiana, his love for Indiana, his feeling that maybe he's got a little bit more right to clap back at times than than the average coach would, and maybe he does. I mean, like, there's there's at least some vouch for that, right? Like, the guy is a program legend. He's one of the best players the program's ever produced, one of the most beloved players the program's ever produced. And to his credit, these first three years have not been, you know, outstanding. Like, let's also not be fair they've not been terrible. If you look at his first three seasons here, um, you know, he's 62 and 39. He's ever so slightly, but he's above water in conference play. He's got two top half finishes in three years. It could be a lot worse, I guess, is my point. And yeah, and I don't, I don't disagree I think it all just, I, yeah. I just feel like it all is a little bit more of kind of like, a, well, I come from the NBA and the NBA, these, you know, this is, this stands as essentially me meeting my minimum requirements. Yes, and but also, I mean, I would say that he set himself the expectations higher than that. But also, um, I, I do think there, you know, I think he's missing the part of the the job that you have to talk to the fan base and the recruits and sort of be the spokesperson for the program. And I think this is what some football coaches struggle with, um, that they just think, well, that's not my job. That's not that's not what I have to do. I got to worry about football and that's all I got to do. And I think the criticism kind of expands when the fact that they only they don't well now they don't have any recruits for next year and sort of the recruiting strategy going back to last season with leaving a roster spot open when injuries actually played a significant role in the season they could have used another guard you know <laughs> really <laughs> quite a bit at uh, multiple times a season uh, multiple long stretches that you could sort of say here's why I did what I did or here's where maybe I did made a misstep. Um, you know, I don't have as much of a problem. I know some people sort of, um, sort of, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Shudder when he sort of criticized, like Malik was terrible or Trey was terrible. I mean, that doesn't bother me because I think these hold, he's trying to hold people accountable and that's kind of his plain speak. And it, I, I think that is fine because I think he's equally willing to dole out praise when Khalil Ware, for instance, you know, dominates uh, on Sunday. But I do think his his sort of approach to sort of I'm I'm immune from criticism or I'm above criticism, um, and then saying true fans is not going to uh, make his road any easier. I just don't, and um, you know I get his frustration, but I also think that he's sort of contributed to maybe some of the 
um, hysteria. I think that's fair. No, I, I don't. I don't think that's unfair at all. And I think, you know, I, if anything, I wrote this last night. There's almost an extent to which I think Indiana, if if this is going to be the play, like if this is going to be the the attitude, then you kind of just need to lean into it. Like, you, you I mean, he's to... turning he's turning full heel in front of our eyes. Like this. Well, but like, but I'm thinking happened. about Anthony Leo too, and like you know, there's I mean, there's there's arguably no person in that program that's actually got more of a right to tell fans to chill out than Anthony Leo. Like he's from Bloomington. He's played in Indiana for four years. He's not paid like a coach. There's always an extent to which fairly or not, and I understand the NIL's change the way people feel about these players a little bit, you know, but fairly or not, there's always an extent to which we look at these million dollar figures the coaches get and say, well, that's, you know, the old mad men line. That's what the money is for. Like if you're going to get paid $5 million a year, like three and a half million of that is basically just putting up with all of the headache and frustration and, and, you know, hysteria that can, you know, come out of it. Players still, even if you're making some NIL money, shouldn't be necessarily, you know, kind of subject to that. And then there's also the element too, of I think, you know, when, and I've been one of them to be like, I'll be very upfront when people who are neutral observers, media members, whatever say like hey this isn't very healthy like they're you know i mean greg doyle had a column last week you know that, that i thought actually used a, a very apt metaphor which was you know indiana fans can be like a nuclear reactor when they're harnessed properly they can power cities you know that their, their their power can you know run just whatever can it just has immeasurable sort of capacity when they're mismanaged and and meltdown happens they can destroy everything you know, within like a two mile radius or whatever. And when people, you know, when, when people like me or Greg say, you know, that the, the fan base is sort of tendency toward panic or, you know, toward assuming the worst does create problems at times. It does create an environment where sometimes it's harder to recruit or it's harder to keep guys or whatever. One of the, you know, fairly consistent, I would say, um, responses I get is, I don't think the kids hear that at the level that you think they do. Well, here's a, here's a player pretty directly telling you they hear, you know, here's like, here's well, a player I, pretty yeah. direct. My, my point is, I understand what you're saying about Woodson and ultimately Woodson is a constant here. He's the coach. Players will come and go and coaches are older. They're expected to be a little bit more, you know, sort of circumspect and whatever. But like if if you've got a player saying it too, like there's almost an extent to which it's like, well, then just lean into this and just like, you, you know, don't 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 try to be diplomatic about it. Anymore. Just lean into it and make that part of your whole thing is like, you know, you need to calm out. You're to, to use Anthony Hill's words. You need to chill out and we're going to chill you. I mean, I don't know exactly. Oh, yeah. And, and I like, don't necessarily. I, I, and my thing wasn't that I don't think I love it. Right. Like, I think that's one, a way to do it. Right. And and fun and, and makes it interesting, certainly unique. Um, I'm just saying it's going to make the path that much harder for Mike Woodson. That That's not sort of like you could, I, I don't have begrudge the players criticizing anybody or, or using their platform. I mean, I think that's what we've seen now. This is the era of athlete empowerment. And so if they want to sort of call fans and, and be the spokesperson for Mike Woodson that he is not. Um, yeah. I mean, that's fine. I just think it's going to make it, that is going to curdle, a part of a fan base that's already sort of passed him like that he's sort of turn against him and make things more difficult. And to your point, I do think part of what Anthony Leo was speaking to and a lot of the sort of um, frustration, I think from the program side is that, um, you know, they haven't talked about it yet, but you know, uh, there was a push with fans like talking directly to Liam McNeely on social media and doing that kind of stuff. And who knows how much of an impact ha that has. And, and, but I do think that's part of, of what that they're referring to that that kind of needs to that's a that's a bridge too far like why what does he have to do with their struggles this season and why would you sort of try to do that um is what i took it as and then and then they in a, a defense of the coach but um so yeah i, I don't disagree with it i think it's a, a, i think they should lean into it i'm fine with that i think that's like i said it's it makes for it will make for an interesting postseason here but at the same time, it's not going to make his sort of next six months, especially when you consider 
that, like I said, he's going to be rebuilding the roster in such a significant way. We'll leave most of the rebuilding talk for the offseason because Lord knows we'll have enough time for that. Yeah, yeah, let's, that wasn't just said. Let's that talk yeah. um, briefly about the Michigan State game. Um, I, 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 anybody who was watching me tweet during the game will know this because I hammered this point over and over again. I cannot think of a better advertisement for how important Trey Galloway has become than this game. He's in the game for about the first six and a half minutes. Um, he's wearing a sleeve on his on his knee. Indiana starts on a 20 to five run. He leaves the game. The score is 20 to five. Indiana's lead actually crests 24 to seven. So 17 points. And then from 24 to seven through until Michigan state's high water mark, which is at the nine forty eight mark of the second half, Indiana only scores. And I think about 20, I want to say about 22 minutes Indiana only scores 22 points. And actually the defense isn't terrible, although Indiana kind of loses touch with Tyson Walker in particular. And that's kind of the thing with Michigan State is like that a lot else hasn't gone right for them, but Tyson Walker is still just an elite shot maker. And so if you lose, if you lose him in their offense or you just don't get tight enough to him defensively, he'll still get comfortable and he'll have a run where he scores 10 points in five minutes or whatever. Um but offensively, Indiana just looked completely bogged down. You know, and Xavier Johnson, I think, had to find his way through the game. I think you could really tangibly see how much of the ball screen offense had been built around Trey Galloway and Kalel Ware because that was, I mean, that was Xavier Johnson's bread and butter with Trace Jackson Davis was, was high ball screens and, and just ball screen offense. And it just looked like he wasn't comfortable in it. And you felt like he were, it was it was like he was running somebody else's offense for the first time in his Indiana career in a weird way if that makes sense, because it had, it had been bid toward a different part. Um, I thought Indiana got a little bit sort of jumper happy at times, picked the McKinsey and Baco. And in fairness, I thought, I thought Michigan State tightened some things up defensively, particularly along the perimeter. But then Indiana kind of gets to this place where, you know, they, they get down what, again, I think it was 53 to 46, if I'm not mistaken. And then um, and Baco and Johnson hit a couple threes to kind of get momentum turned back in the other direction. And Indiana just defended it for its life. In the last 948, Michigan State scored nine points. And we have not seen this team, particularly without Galloway, who's one of its most important on-ball defenders, defend at that level against an NCAA tournament caliber team really all season in terms of just saying for basically a stretch of almost an entire quarter of the game, you're not even going to get 10 points. And that's what gets this thing done for Indiana. Do you want the news that Kirk Cousins has officially signed with the Falcons live on Is the that, podcast? Uh, Four year deal. Reaction. Is it is it really official? Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, he's an adult. So I'm just I'm tired. Ang anguish. Anguish. It's it's not anguish because he's better than any quarterback they've had for the last I mean, he's even better than probably whatever the, the end of Matt Ryan's career was. And they have everything oh. else. That's the thing about the Falcons. They have everything else. They have a good offensive, not a great one, but a good offensive line. They've got, you know, two top tier sort of receiving targets as long as Kyle Pitts is fully healthy again. And then they've got two great running backs. It, it just feels like they're, I, whatever, you know, it's, Go oh, Falcons, I guess. Did Just you answer rookie, my question did, about Michigan State. Did, did you want a rookie quarterback? Is no. That what, I mean, well, that's the thing is there's – they weren't – I don't think there was any realistic way for them to get up into the top five to get – you know, I mean, I'm not totally I'm, – I'm not totally there with uh, Drake May. I am there with Caleb Williams. I'm actually broadly there with Jaden Daniels, but I don't think there was any chance they were going to get Daniels. I don't think Daniels was, you know, a realistic option. So, I mean, whatever, you know. I, so let's bring it on. Let's do it. I, I, derailed, I derailed it. I derailed it. I'm just going to paint. It. I'm going to paint his number on my chest. I don't Cousins. even know what number he's going to wear. Cousins. They need to get rid of the jerseys. If if you know what, if they go back to normal adult jerseys and not the XFL two stuff they've been wearing the last five years, <laughs> then I'm all then I'm all in. All right, then, then you're all in. You know, get me on that bus to the Super Bowl wherever it is. I'm sure we'll lose it somehow. Anyway, Michigan State, go. Uh, it was just how, what about the game? I didn't. I missed the last part of the question. I was. I was. Way, I was anticipating making you sad. You're just so, that uh, wrapped up. You think, like yeah. the Michigan State alum you are. Um, yeah. 
No, the, the particularly the way I thought Indiana defended down the stretch. Again, nine points in the last nine forty-eight. They allow. They get a hold of Tyson Walker. I think he scored four of those nine points. Um, you know, I thought Indiana kind of figured some things out offensively. Obviously, made some big shots. And and weirdly, for a team that shot sixteen of twenty-seven from the free throw line, or wait, no, sorry, that's a different game. I'm looking at the wrong one. For a team that <laughs> that shot five of twelve at the free throw line, which is even worse. Um, actually made a couple important free throws at the end, not least Kalel Blair's game winner. Um, but I just thought that, you know, whatever Michigan State's shortcomings, I don't know that we've seen Indiana defend that well for that long of a stretch against an NCAA tournament caliber team this season. Well, what they, I don't remember what the timing was, but they, they were down seven at one point after leading – uh, in the second, you know, after leading by all that much in the second half, and they sort of studied, studied themselves without Galloway. Um, and, you know, they turned the ball over a bunch. Um, but I thought that was the sort of best sort of, I mean, maybe Ohio State, obviously they came back for more, but um, just in terms of not letting the game get away from after they sort of had that gut punch um, was really impressive. And I think Xavier Johnson talked about or, or you know you know just in the last couple of weeks they've just been a different team and once again that showed um that they just sort of found whatever they needed to find to, to, to kind of get across the finish line and I, I think we should talk you know Khalil Ware uh I think he was 14 of the 16 points they had coming out of halftime and then he assisted on the other basket uh he finished with 28 points um it was really you know the the strategy for Probably about 11 minutes in the second half was just pass it to him in the post and see what he can do and 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 kind of get it done. Um, and you know, uh, Tom Izzo, uh, who also talked about Mike Woodson, was very complimentary of Clear Ware because they had played Oregon um, a year ago um, and said that he wasn't very, even though that was one of his better games. You know, wasn't very good, wasn't very strong. Um, and this was a different. You know, he ate them alive uh, on on Sunday. So, um, you know, I think that was sort of. The difference and obviously his draft stock just keeps kind of going up and up and up where was i mean it it is you're right it's draft stock does keep going up and um i'm about to call him. he is on a particularly dominant streak i think it's 90 points in his last four games um and that's with one of them being you know he didn't score for an entire half of maryland um he has found it's it's almost like a lot – he's doing a lot of what he was doing earlier in the season, and then some of the stuff he was trying, particularly the mid-range stuff, you know, the turnaround stuff, going to going with both hands, he's starting to work a lot better. And it just feels like increasingly um, he is just sort of like the, the sort of player that probably we thought – not we, but like we in the, in the most general sense thought he would be last year at Oregon. And I think, you know, I think was, or uh, what's, I think Izzo referred to, he's added some weight, um, which we've, as we've discussed, I think has been a big piece for him. But I think there's also been a, a greater understanding for him of just how dominant he can be. And, you know, I mean, even, you know, I think he had 17 and 14 when Indiana beat Minnesota at home. But there were still some moments in that game where I thought Pharrell Payne gave him some trouble. And this is, I mean, this is going back to January 12th. You know, Payne, finishes with 17 points and 10 rebounds of his own in that game. I, I couldn't tell you anything Pharrell Payne did in that win in Minnesota. But, I, but you know, or the, the one in Minneapolis last week, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kalel Ware goes for 26 and 11. You know, there's just it, – it just feels like there's a a level of, of separation between what he was even a month or two ago and what he's become. And if there's, you know, I think if, if there is a path for any kind of optimism for Indiana in the Big Ten tournament this weekend, I think a lot of it, goes through having a guy who suddenly looks, you know, for all the world, like a, a genuinely unstoppable big man. Now you're probably going to have to play Penn state. We'll talk a little bit, just a, a little bit about the draw here in a minute. You're probably going to have to play Penn state, obviously, which, you know, has been a problem for Indiana with their disruptiveness and the backcourt and everything. And then after that, what, who do they get after that? Nebraska. Yeah. So, you know, who they've two, really not, two not great matchups for them defensively. If you can find a way to counter that with, you know, more of what we've seen so far from, from Kalel Ware these last however many, um, these last however many games, um, then maybe you have a chance to spring a couple upsets in Minneapolis. He's just been, he has, you know, 
he's almost kind of, I guess, gone underappreciated in the sense that like he came in and he met sort of like a minimum expectation of, hey, you were a top 10 recruit. You were meant to be an NBA draft pick. You obviously didn't look anything like that at Oregon. And then he came in and he averaged like 13 and eight and he made some threes and he was good around the rim. And you thought, okay, yes, like that's, that's much more what we thought Kalel Ware would be essentially. And then, so you almost kind of like filed him away because you were so preoccupied with can Indiana find a way to get McKenzie and Baco going? And what does Indiana do without Xavier Johnson? And will Indiana ever find legitimate three point threats and so on? And so you, I don't know that it's fully appreciated, like how much better he's been lately because it was almost like everyone felt like the Kalel the Kalel wear box for this team was ticked but he's actually gone up a level if not two at both ends of the floor that I think has given Indiana a dynamic that has led to as much as anything in terms of individual performances for game in the street well Izzo talked about that too that he's not just improved from last year but from the first two months of the season that he's made substantial improvements in both I mean it's just you know part of what's a shame is that you know really um we talked about his NBA prospects, I think, last on uh, Friday, that if he did come back, you know, pick to win player of the year, maybe, you know, in terms of like, you know, he would be up there. Um, and you, and it speaks to the the development, right? Like that's and something Mike Woodson's talked about, like they've played a role in that as well and sort of um, helped build him up. And, um, you know, they might necessarily, you know, if they make a tournament run, they'll bear, bear the fruits of that labor. But um, next year they really would if he came if you know if he wasn't you know probably going to go to the draft but um, you know he has made just just you know leaps and bounds at every stage of this season um, you know kind of kept going and and um, it's been impressive. It is hard as we've discussed for me to imagine him coming back. Now it, it's worth dropping in here. There have been a lot of numbers thrown around, and so I was told. In, in one corner last night that Indiana would have unlimited NIL money to rebuild the roster, which is, is fun to think about. Um, you know, just having like a $200 million college basketball roster. But we, we would start doing the European They signed thing. Kirk Cousins. They, they, they were the... <laughs> we'd start doing the European soccer thing where we talk about how much they make a week rather than how yeah. much they make a year. Like, <laughs> not talking about, he makes 50,000 pounds a week. Why are you paying him in pounds? Don't ask. Um, but... I do think Indiana is is going to have significantly more. I mean, I, I think Indiana was already in a really competitive place with yeah. NIL in terms of, particularly in the Big Ten. I think we're talking about Indiana moving into the top ten, if not the top five nationally in NIL resources this offseason in terms of being able to go out and get guys. Having said that, as previously discussed, it's not a particularly strong draft. Um at least it's not. But you make an offer. If if you have the money, you make an offer. Right? Sure, make sure. It, yeah, I just yeah, I yeah, suspect yeah. that it's not going to be anything that you couldn't get on a mid round, mid even sure. late round, first round yeah. pick, you know, wage scale. Plus, then you're starting your clock for your second contract, and you're getting a three year minimum guarantee, whatever. Yeah. Um, but what I think it does help you with, you know, there's so much talk about guards, understandably, and, and I don't want to get into names because it's really easy to start speculating about whatever. But to kind of wrap this up and just put a bow in this because we got to spin it forward, but we'll be back from Minneapolis kind of at some point. I know we'll both be there. Will you be there for the duration? Yes. Yeah, and I, I will be too. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll put a bow on this kind of whatever happens, but to kind of wrap things up today, um, I think the important thing for Indiana, as much as anything is, you know, Mike Woodson can look at any elite big man in the portal and there will be elite big men in the portal. Like if there literally was one last year that got Kalel Ware. He can say, this is what I've done with Trace Jackson Davis. To a certain extent, a anyway, different kind of player, but this is what I've done with Malik Renu. This is what I've done for Glowware. Imagine what I can do for you. And there's yeah. always going to be an element. You know, I, I'm with anybody who says Indiana needs to get away from playing these sort of like two big reliant lineups. But you still need a rim protecting presence. You still need a focal point in the post. If you look at, you know, if you look at the, I don't know, like the top five teams in the Big Ten this year. Um, the only one that I would argue didn't necessarily have kind of like a, a, a big man that could at least be a bit of a, a fulcrum for them was Illinois. You know, Illinois was a little bit smaller, more interchangeable, but obviously Purdue has ED, Nebraska has ranked last. Um, you know, even Northwestern, I know he's not like their, their most important player, but even Northwestern's got Matthew Nicholson who can just go do a bunch of scrappy work for them and just, you know, make a nuisance of himself, be difficult to deal with in the post. Point is, you're better with a good big man. 
as long as you surround them with other important pieces. And, and I think it's it's going to be really relevant from, from like what's an assuming Khalil where does leave for the NBA to be able to look at somebody in the portal or I mean, maybe Malik renews the internal solution. I think it's, it's hard to imagine him defending the five consistently, but one way or the other, if Woodson does go into the for another sort of true or five, then he has a pretty compelling case for whoever that is to say, this is what I'm capable of doing to your game in just a year or two years time, basically. You like that word fulcrum. I do like the word fulcrum. It's a good word. That's all I have. That's my analysis on that. Let's shut it down there for today. Um, again, the next time we talk, we'll both be in Minneapolis, but he's Mike Nice, like I'm Zach Osmer for the Herald Times for the Indianapolis Star. I'm sorry about my voice. It's beginning to come back. Hopefully, uh, this won't be a problem for much longer. This has been Mind Your Banners from March 11th, 2024. We will talk to you soon.